18 hours out. Destination unknown, a military secret. The largest overseas expedition ever to sail from the United States, guarded by the blue ensign of the American Navy. Southwards from Britain, some 3,000 miles away, an even greater convoy, twice the size, moves in its appointed place across the seas, shielded by the white ensign of the British Navy. Destroyers in close support, cruisers on the flanks, and beyond the horizon, the battleships. From the decks of aircraft carriers, and from the shore, Planes of the Fleet Air Arm and Coastal Command patrol the skies and search the seas. Advance outposts of an elaborate protective screen. East Northeast, the American convoy. So west by west, the British. Nothing like these two armadas had disturbed the waters since the world was made. This end operation an operation that began some four months earlier in Washington, D.C. The President of the United States welcomed the Prime Minister of Great Britain. The gravity of the moment had brought them together. The lights burned all night that night in the White House where the two leaders met with their combined chiefs of staffs. For this was the picture taking all too definite form in the minds of the civil, military, and naval leaders now locked in secret conference. Two Axis spearheads were headed east. In the north, von Bock was hewing his way through the Ukraine to the Caucasus. In the south, Rommel was driving toward the Egyptian border. These two spearheads were intended to meet in Iran and head eastward towards India. In the Orient, Japan had occupied the coast of China, the East Indies, Malaya, and Burma in preparation for the drive westward through India. If these two enemy spearheads were allowed to meet, Russia and China, except for their remote Arctic ports, would be completely isolated. Japanese raw materials and German production would be combined. The peoples of Europe, Asia, and Africa, seven-eighths of the world's population, would be enslaved. By morning a decision, both bold and revolutionary. Bold because in this our darkest hour we dared to take the offensive. Revolutionary because that offensive was conceived, planned, and executed by the peoples of two nations. The time and the place had been agreed upon. The code name for the combined operation was Acrobat. The two great elements were time and secrecy. 125 days in which to plan and launch an offensive from bases 3,000 miles apart. An operation involving hundreds of thousands of American and British soldiers and sailors. Millions of American and British working men and women. Only by whose combined efforts could the plan become a reality but from whom the plan itself must be kept secret. A few score men, no more, knew in its entirety the plan for this greatest of combined operations. In London and Washington, British and American officers were placed at adjoining desks to work through the days and nights of grind and toil that lay ahead. And gradually, in the enforced daily intimacy, men grew to know and respect each other. Thus was born the relationship out of which an Allied army came into being. To them came hourly reports on the vast undertaking of forging the striking weapon. It was a race against time.
United States men and supplies poured eastward toward the Atlantic seaboard. In Britain also, by road and rail, an army was on the move. Day and night, the dockers worked. Records were broken in tonnage put aboard in one ship. For every soldier, British and American, 10 tons of equipment. On both sides of the Atlantic, the effort was tremendous. Guns, trucks, aircraft, petrol, water, food, barbed wire, locomotive. Of ammunition alone, we shipped 520 different kinds. Convoy continued its hidden way. My name's McAdams, Joe McAdams. Kansas City, Kansas. Private, first class. I was on one of those ships you're looking at. Part of the biggest show on earth and didn't know it. Too darn many ships to see all at once. Well, we've been hollering for action. Now we were going to get it. But we didn't know where. Norway, France, Italy, China. Finally, on the fifth day, we got the news. I mean, what we'd been waiting to hear. They handed out a little guidebook. And I remember the first line. You are to do duty in North Africa as a soldier of the United States. Give me kind of a kick. Why North Africa? What was the plan called Acrobat? The convoy from America was heading east, the one from Britain heading south. 
At a given point west of Gibraltar, the British convoy would divide. For 12 hours, the two halves would proceed in opposite direction. Then the second half would reverse its course and follow the first, passing Gibraltar 24 hours behind. Thus, with clock-like precision, the combined operations would begin with simultaneous landing at Casablanca, or Rand, Algiers. Casablanca to protect our flank against an Axis attack through Spanish Morocco. Oran and Algiers to secure bases from which to press eastward. Then the occupation of Tunisia, from which we could cut Rommel's supply lines across the Mediterranean. Next, to trap and destroy Rommel's Africa Corps between our allied forces and the British Eighth Army. Thus, one arm of the Axis pincer would be amputated and supply lines around the Cape of Good Hope would be shortened by half through winning control of the Mediterranean. North Africa would be ours with bases from which to stab at the heart of the Axis citadel. Those were the main objectives of the plan called Acrobat. In both convoys, the men kept fit, now knowing the task that lay ahead. For most of them, this voyage was a new experience. They'd never been so far from home before. That's certainly true of me. My name's George Metcalf. I was a greengrocer in Suey Street. We had a shop a long time. Only we're a military family, really. My dad was at Passchendaele and I was at Dunkirk. Never met such a collection of blokes as we got on this ship. Chaps from Glasgow, New York, London, Melbourne, Cape Town, Montreal, Chicago, Birmingham, Wellington, Bethnal Green, the old issue. I reckon it's about time this team of internationals got cracking. When I was peeling spuds just now, I made up quite a letter to my girl, all about the way these ships zigzag and about flying fish and whales. Of course, we haven't seen any yet, but I reckon she'll like to know I'm enjoying myself. And now I got something else to tell her too. The best news for a long time. They just put it up on the ship's board. But the Eighth Army's offensive was only one phase of a larger strategy. Included therein, the bombings of Genoa, Naples, Turin, bombings of the Renault factory turning out Rommel's tanks. All these are part of the plan called Acrobat, of which the enemy still knew nothing. Nothing of the submarine trip to Africa by General Mark Clark, with a message to be smuggled into France. Nothing of the arrival at Gibraltar of General Eisenhower, where he was joined by General Henri Giraud, who had received General Clark's smuggled message. The enemy knew nothing until the last possible moment when the first half of the convoy from Britain steamed past the fortress of Gibraltar. It was at night that the ships passed through the straits. The time had been carefully chosen, for here, in narrow waters, attack seemed certain. Aboard ship and on the rock, everyone stood to, but the ships moved steadily on. It was as though, for the moment, the enemy's sword had fallen from his hand through indecision. This time, it was in Rome and in Berlin that the lights burned all night. For the first time since the war's beginning, somebody else was calling the tune. But before the enemy could collect its wits or its forces, our ships lay, as planned, off their appointed destination. Events planned four months earlier moved to a climax. Off Casablanca stood the convoy from America. To the troops aboard spoke their commander, General Patton. Soldiers and sailors, it is not known whether the French African Army will contest our landing, but all resistance, by whomever offered, must be destroyed. However, when any of the French soldiers seek to surrender, you will accept it and treat them with the respect you a brave opponent and future ally. Remember, the French are not Nazis or Japs. 
November the 8th, 1942. Orders of the day. The words play ball transmitted by the task force commanders signifies that all forces are to take vigorous and offensive action against the enemy. A large searchlight shown in a vertical position at night signifies that the enemy has agreed to the terms of the Allies. Zero hour. From America, the president broadcast by short wave. We do not want your land. We fight a common enemy. From London, General Charles de Gaulle. Do not resist. From Gibraltar, General Giraud. We welcome the allies to French soil. How would these pleas be answered? Meantime, at Algiers, our landing craft also met fire from shore batteries, which were soon silenced by ships of the British Navy. Here, too, the French troops ashore were asked by radio to indicate a friendly attitude by throwing their searchlight beams vertical. It wasn't long before, here and there along the coast, searchlights were seen pointing to the heavens. As dawn broke, fighter planes from Gibraltar, fitted with extra fuel tanks, took off without even waiting to hear whether the landing fields at Algiers had been kept. By 7 a.m., resistance at Algiers was finished. British and American troops had landed east and west of the city, penetrated 10 to 15 miles, and held the heights and all vantage points. In Algiers, on that famous November the 8th, was Admiral Jean Dallon, French Vice Chief of State under Marshal Pétain. It was after consultation with him that the French commanding general agreed to surrender the city. Meanwhile, at Oran, American paratroops and airborne infantry flown from Britain 1,500 miles away had landed to capture airfields, while other American troops had poured ashore on the beaches, protected by the British Navy. Here, as in Algiers, the fighting lasted for only a few hours, but at Casablanca, the battle still raged. batteries and the heavy guns of the French battleship Jean Bar and several cruisers, destroyers and gunboats put out a devastating fire. Gunnery from American ships coupled with precision bombing silenced those guns.
striking inland from the beaches north and south of the city. Shock troops cut the railway, other lines of communication, then converged upon the town. Two days later, the Germans invaded unoccupied France, whereupon Admiral Darlan, declaring Pétain a prisoner of the Axis and himself chief of state, ordered the cessation of hostilities. In proof of the surprise of our landings, German armistice commissions were caught flat-footed in each city. Their job, to bleed North Africa of her raw materials and farm products. The people of North Africa were evidently not sorry to see them go. Events moved swiftly. To Algiers came General Anderson, commanding the British First Army. General Giraud took command of the French land forces. United under General Eisenhower, they were ready to take the field. Once more, the Tricolour, the Stars and Stripes, and the Union Jack flew side by side. But the enemy had lost no time. Across the Mediterranean, by sea and by air, he was pouring men and equipment into Tunis and Bizerta. Despite this, we determined to start the campaign at once, hoping to reach the distant cities before the enemy's grasp had become too strong. This was a bold decision, for the British First Army was as yet little more than one division, and the bulk of the American forces were needed to safeguard our position in Morocco. We had other disadvantages. Roads were poor. Railways inadequate. beyond the mountains had short supply lines from Sicily and Sardinia. Our own, stretching forward from the improvised base at Algiers, were four times the length. Even more important, we lacked as yet forward airfields, whereas the enemy in Tunisia had all the permanent airfields he needed. In less than a month, the weather would break. Could our slender force, in the last days of autumn, achieve a flashing success against time and a stronger enemy. With immense energy, the attempt was made. By road, Allied infantry, tanks and artillery moved towards the hills. By rail, went General Giraud's men with mules for mountain transport. By air, flew British and American parachutists to capture suitable ground for airfields and the tactical points nearby. commandos to Bougie and Bone, the latter 300 miles to the east and only 60 miles from the Tunisian border. Here, the airfield which our parachutists had taken was already under attack from the Luftwaffe. permanent forward airfield and had to be fought for repeatedly. In three columns, we advanced towards Tunis and Bizerta. And still the enemy poured into Africa. By mid-November, a thousand a day. Among them, Marshal Kesselring, Mediterranean commander-in-chief, the man who had made his name infamous at Warsaw and Rotterdam. November the 18th, 10 days after our first landings, our mixed force of Allied troops had crossed the frontier into Tunisia and skirmishes were frequent. On we went, 
small units of French, British, Americans held up here, gaining there, fighting Rhodes as well as Germans, but pushing on. By November the 22nd, we were in Beja, 450 miles on the road to Tunis. News came that 30 miles on, the French under General Barre were holding Measures El Bab against the Germans. The French were fighting stubbornly, equipped with little more than machine guns and rifles. General Anderson promptly moved to support them. Together, we held measures, henceforth a pivotal point, and forced the Germans back. But now we went into the plains and were increasingly exposed to the enemy's more numerous tanks and aircraft. November the 25th, the first real tank clash. tanks destroyed and the rest withdrew. And on we push towards Tunis and Bizerta, racing against time and the weather. 60 miles from Bizerta, 50 miles, 40 miles. Our supply lines inexorably thinning, our reinforcements fewer and fewer. 30 miles from Bizerta, 20 miles, 18 miles from Tunis, 60, 50, and from the hills, our patrols saw the city. But now the enemy attack rose to a crescendo. From the skies, a bombardment to which we had no adequate answer. Casualties heavy. Even as the goal was in sight, the race had been lost. This first thrust, this adventurous gamble, had failed. We fell back to the protection of the hill. But even as we withdrew to regroup our forces, we encountered a new enemy. Winter was upon us. Our hastily improvised airfields were flooded, our planes earthbound. The roads became running streams. Our tanks immobilized. All hopes of a quick victory had finally foundered in a sea of mud. But the race for Tunis and Bezert had not been in vain. For our battle lines, now stabilized, ran south from Medjiz el Bab, through Usultia, Faid, Maknazi, and Gafsa, along the barrier ridge of mountains known as the Great Dorsal, which separated the German occupied coastal plain from the mountainous regions to the west. German expansion was possible only through a series of passes traversing the Great Dorsal. And all through the winter months, we held those passes against incessant German attack. This was the period referred to by the world as one of military inactivity. A period during which we sustained nearly half the total casualties incurred during the whole North African campaign. That's right. When you read in your papers about lulls that don't apply to George Metcalf and the poor bloody infantry, never did. We were on the job every night, patrols in the hills and in the woods. Oof. 
we go with some brands and Tommy guns and a few Mills bombs, and if we're lucky, we scupper a few Jerry's and bring a few prisoners in. Old Fred Parker's the best. He was a poacher, a second nature to old Fred. When we get back, we're camouflaged, so you can't tell whether we're men or walking lumps of mud. We picked up about half too nizzy when we got back this morning. We just about scraped it off when we had to go out again at dusk and pick up the other half. <laughs> Great life. You'd think mud would be different in Africa. Different from France, say. Old Fred says it weighs heavier here and don't smell the same, but me, I can't tell any difference. It turns white bread into brown, just like the other stuff. Keeping the automatics and rifles clean is the worst. Old Fred's only got about half the tail of his shirt left. There's one thing we do thank God for, the mules. Fancy that, mules. If it wasn't for the mules, we'd just about starve. Not that we eat them, I don't mean that, but they bring up the rations, see? Nothing but mules or eagles could ever get here. Mud, just mud. I told my girl I'll stick to her like mud, and I can't say more than that. Whenever the fields were dry enough, our planes took off to tackle the Luftwaffe. Though still outnumbered, in four weeks they shot down 241 enemy aircraft for a loss of 89 of our own. Further back, day after day, the strategic air force was taking off to kill the enemy's effort at its starting point. Liberators from the east, fortresses from the west, went forth to destroy enemy bases in Italy, Sardinia, Sicily. offensive could be launched until spring. Against its coming, there was to be on either side of the great dorsal a building up of power. Over supply routes that spanned on the German side 150 miles of water, and on our side hundreds of miles of land, and then thousands of miles of water. The longest assembly lines in the world were in operation from the factories of the United States and Britain, from Birmingham to Algiers, from Detroit to Iran, from Manchester to Los Angeles, from Leeds, from Pittsburgh to Casablanca. assembled on the spot, loaded with freight and sped forward. The South Atlantic became an airway as well as a seaway. From Brazil, flights of P-38s equipped with extra fuel tanks were flown across the sea. Each flight led by a flying fortress which provided navigation. From Gibraltar, Aircraft which had been brought by ship from Britain and reassembled on the rock were flown off to Tunisia. Nearly 1,500 planes reached the front by this route. Roads to the front were being built where none before existed.
on wet, still unfinished landing strips, giant planes sat down with cargoes of materiel. A reservoir of power was filling up. Tunisia was to be the theater of a major campaign, a campaign to be fought where Scipio had fought, and Hannibal, where already three times in history great armies had been destroyed between the mountains and the sea. These hills and plains were again to echo to the tempest of battle. Not now the trumpeting of elephants, but the crash of tanks and artillery. Not now an empire, but a way of life at stake. This Christmas 1942, our soldiers and airmen in Tunisia and the Western Desert gathered together in little churches or under the open sky. And doing so, they thought of their homes and loved ones, hundreds or thousands of miles away. Our soldier sports were of New York and the Middle West, of the cities and villages of France, of the plains and hills of India, of homes in Cape Town and the African belt, or among the snows of Canada, or in the Christmas sunshine of New Zealand and Australia, and among the fog and rain of London and Edinburgh. And they thought of their comrades who had already been killed, and of the cause for which they had been killed, the cause that had brought all of them across the seas to fight the cause of liberty and tolerance and dignity and peace. And of how the horizon was brightening a little as though a new day were being born. Christmas dinner.
fared well at Christmas. Including the pets. to take notice of the kids. First off, they were kind of shy. But Arab kids are no different from the kids back home when it comes to candy. A lot of them looked about half starved. The Germans had picked the land clean. So we gave half our milk ration to the Red Cross. And they ladled it out. Duty, we just roamed around, looked. And we saw some mighty strange sights. girls look like behind the veils. Wondering was about as far as we got. One Sunday, the middle of January, we were hanging around, catching up in the news from home, when we were rooted out for assembly. They told us to polish our brass and shine our leather. Some of us said, what's the big idea? Well, we found out. And you could have knocked me over with a tank. It was the Prez himself, riding along in a jeep. When we saw Mr. Churchill come in, not puffing his cigar, we knew something big was cooking. In a small seaside hotel at Casablanca, discussions began at once. Their purpose? To design the shape of victory in Africa and beyond. First, a meeting was arranged between Generals de Gaulle and Giraud, who had succeeded Admiral Dalla, assassinated a month earlier. Out of the meeting was to grow the union of the fighting French, who had never lost hope, and the French for whom hope had been reborn. Second, the united command for the new Tunisian campaign was created. The Allied troops in the area were now predominantly British, but by common agreement, General Eisenhower, as his deputy commanders, three British officers, General Alexander on land, Admiral Cunningham on sea, Air Chief Marshal Tedder in the air. Under them, British, American and French officers and men serving side by side, the whole unique in military campaigns. Third, we fixed the terms which would end the fighting. Unconditional surrender. Of all these decisions, our Russian and Chinese allies were kept fully informed. The conference ended, Mr. Churchill flew on to Tripoli to greet the victorious Eighth Army and explain its vital part in forthcoming events. For the decisive hour was at hand. Battle lines were drawn. In the north stood the British First Army. In the center, General Giraud's French troops. In the south, the Americans. Further south, a small group of fighting French had completed its historic 1,500-mile march and taken up positions on the left flank of the British Eighth Army, which faced the formidable Marath Line, behind which barrier Rommel's army, after its long retreat, had entrenched itself. Tunisia was gray with German troops, 15 full divisions. scratch troops these, but battle-wise veterans of Poland, France, the Balkans. They, together with seven Italian divisions, were armed with the most modern types of equipment, including the newest fighters and bombers of the German Luftwaffe. The German orders were, hold Tunisia at all costs, keep control of the Mediterranean. Rommel, standing behind his Marath line, 
saw that he must soon be faced with an attack in the rear from the Allied armies along the Great Dorsal, as well as an assault by the 8th Army at Merritt. He therefore struck first in an endeavor to remove the menace behind him. On February the 14th, the blow was struck. Heavy armored columns burst out of Payet Pass in the mountain barrier and threw into the valley beyond. In the face of their onslaught, Allied armor withdrew with heavy losses. By the 21st, the enemy had forced his way through the Kasserine Pass, and his armored columns were advancing in a three-pronged thrust. One main column aimed at Tabassa, our supply base in southern Tunisia, and another at Tala, key town in our lines of communication. Almost within sight of his objective, he was halted. American, British, and French forces all stood immovable against the final impact, and in counterattack, broke it, while Allied air power pounded Rommel's lines of communication and supply. The threat was ended. Advancing past destroyed German armor, we reoccupied Gasoline Pass, and by March the 17th, the original battle lines had been restored. As soon as Rommel saw that his westward thrust was doomed, he made an abortive attack south against the 8th Army. The Germans unveiled the new Tiger tank, the British the new 17-pounder anti-tank gun. Fifty-two Tiger tanks were left burning huts. From then on, the initiative was ours. Of the various strategies which might now be employed against the enemy, General Eisenhower chose one which envisaged the entire military situation in terms of a cylinder. The Western Wall, Allied land forces along the Great Dorsal. The Northern and Eastern, Allied air and sea power concentrated in the Mediterranean. The seaports of Tunis and Bizerte were to act as the intake valve, through which those enemy troops that escaped the devastating attacks of planes and submarines based at Malta were to be sucked into the cylinder. At the bottom of the cylinder stood the powerful British 8th Army to serve as the piston, which in its upward stroke would push the enemy into an ever smaller space. Still in possession of the enemy were certain high hills to the west of Tunis and Bazaar. Their capture was an essential part of the entire strategy, for these hills were the spark plug, which, when the piston had forced the enemy into a state of high compression, would explode the combustible mass. That was the final strategy. To succeed, perfect coordination would be necessary between land, sea, and air forces. The Northwest African Air Force, commanded by General Spots, was divided into five major groups, of which three were combat. The Strategic Air Force, under General Jimmy Doolittle. These were the big boys, the long-range bombers, pounding away at enemy bases and shipping. Coastal Air Force under Air Marshal Lloyd. Day and night fighters, these, protecting ports and convoys. And finally, the Tactical Air Force, a new conception of air power developed by the British in the Middle East. All fighters and attack bombers, British and American, were placed under one command so that we could strike with the full force of our flying artillery when and where it would do the most good. Air Marshal Cunningham, in command of this group, and General Alexander, in command of all ground forces, lived and worked side by side in a tent camp in the Tunisian mountains. Theirs was a complete partnership, and in it lay the pattern of ultimate victory. By the middle of March, the stage was set. The first move was up to Air Marshal Cunningham. Continuous 24-hour assault, the Marath fortifications were pounded from the air. Then General Alexander gave the signal for the piston to begin its upward stroke. Montgomery, looking ahead, had planned the Marath battle three months before. 
he would strike after a barrage and in moonlight as at El Alamein. But simultaneously, he would begin an outflanking movement on the left. The frontal blow had to cross a gorge, the Wadi Zigzag, and create a bridgehead under cover of which tanks and artillery could cross the Wadi before the enemy's counterattack in force could be met. Three days before the attack, it rained heavily. Our men were holding on like bulldogs. Only four tanks had got across, but with these and their own arms, our infantry kept the bridgehead intact. The enemy, fearing another El Alamein, now withdrew armor from other sectors and threw it in. battle raged, our outflanking left hook by General Freiburg and his New Zealanders, reinforced by the 1st Armoured Division, was racing across 150 miles of desert towards El Hama. The blow was now struck by 50,000 men on the ground and by bombers, fighters and tank busters from the air. down by the Northumbrians at Marath, moved their armour too late. The New Zealanders, thenceforth to be known as the Left Hookers, drove through. The Marath line had been turned. The piston was on the move. Its speed made possible by the feats in road building of the South African engineers. Naval forces shelled and bombed all along the seawall. Our fighters struck at their transport planes, still pouring men in through the intake valve, knocking them out of the sky by the hundreds. army was a constant threat in the north, while in the center the French had attacked at Pichon, and further south the Americans had broken through to El Guitar and McNassie, thus enforcing constant pressure all along the land wall of the cylinder.
April 7th, an American patrols of light tanks striking eastward met patrols of the British 8th Army advancing northward. We got quite a bang out of meeting these guys. 2,000 miles they'd come, fighting all the way. Yes, sir, we got a real bang out of it. These are the guys that broke the back of the Africa Corps. Still, the piston pushed relentlessly on. April the 10th, Sfaxville. April the 12th, Seuss. And on April the 20th, after exactly 30 days of fighting in pursuit, the 8th Army had driven the enemy into the hills beyond Enfideville. And in its wake was a great homecoming. What got me was watching those villagers coming back, mostly on little donkeys, piled up with so much stuff you'd wonder how they carried it. Reminded me of the Bible somehow. You know, the donkeys and the hills behind and, and these folks trekking home. There was one old chap spoke a bit of English and he comes up to me and old John McAdams and he says, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And then he started shaking hands with us. I thought he was never gonna let go. And as we watched him going down the hill, Joe says to me, he says, you know, George, I had a buddy killed the other day and I was pretty sore about it. But now all these poor devils coming home gives the old thing a kind of a meaning. Well, then when we went down to the village, it was just the same down there. Little Jewish boys taking off the yellow stars they'd been made to wear as if they was lepers. And then our army doctors attending to the women and the youngsters, just as if they was on the panel back home. I certainly felt less browned off. I certainly did. The rapid advance of the 8th Army had left the American divisions of McNassie and El Guitar far behind the battle area. General Alexander now switched these divisions to the north. This remarkable 200-mile march across the heavy traffic streams of the 1st Army's lines of supply was accomplished without once interrupting the eastward flow, and this in complete secrecy. piston had completed its upward stroke. The desired state of enemy high compression had been achieved. Now to capture the spark plug, the vital hills west of Tunis and Bezerra. This led to a number of major battles of which five were typical. Hill 609, Longstop Hill, Gubalat Plain, Jebel Mansour, and Takruna. The 8th Army struck at Takruna. The French 19th Corps attacked Jebel Mansour. On the Gubalat Plain, the British 6th Armoured Division, striking towards Tunis, had drawn upon it most of the enemy's remaining armour. main purpose was accomplished, the drawing to this battlefield of von Arnim's tanks and guns and their destruction. Meantime, the British 78th Division was pressing the attack on Longstop Hill.
12 days, the hills echoed with gunfire. Positions were taken, lost, and retaken. When the German lines broke at last, their dead lay in hundreds, unburied on the battlefields. As our infantry went forward, engineers and pioneers built roads across the mountaintops for vital supplies to reach them. In 14 days, they built 11 miles. Meanwhile, further north, the Americans had embarked on their phase of the campaign. This started with the assault on Hill 609. Long-range artillery started the attack. guys and we got to the top as they'd been at the bottom. Well, we took it. Thus, one by one, von Arnim's strongholds in the mountains fell. The Germans had been outfought. Now they were to be outwitted. General Alexander knew their fear of the Eighth Army. So he reinforced that fear with heavy bombardments and local attacks from Montgomery's front. At the same time, he secretly transferred the 4th Indian and the 1st and 7th Armoured Divisions from the 8th to the 1st Army in the north, whence the main attack was to come. The spark plug was ours, and we were now ready to explode the combustible mass. Now to pour on the power. Now to give the apostles of power an education in the use of it. Americans in the air with everything that could fly. British and Americans on the ground with everything that could shoot. French artillery, French infantry. British Navy. All 
poured forth their concentrated fury. Warfare such as the inventors of the Blitz had never dreamed of. The Nazis' challenge to the free world to fight or surrender was being answered. Hours fighting, the hard crust of German resistance was shattered. Our armor crashed through. The Americans blitzed their way into Bazaar. The British smashed right through the center to capture Tunis. Then a British armored column crashed across the neck of Cape Bon to Hammamet. Another British column raced around the tip of the Cape to prevent any evacuation. The whole Axis mass was split into four segments. The end came quickly. By tens, by hundreds, by thousands they came, on foot in trucks and behind their bands. The greatest mass surrender of fully equipped troops in modern history. We had lost nearly 70,000 men, dead, wounded and missing. 35,000 British, 18,000 Americans, 15,000 French. But for every man we had lost, the enemy lost five. And at the end, 15 full divisions, 266,000 of their best men laid down their arms. No Bataan this, no Crete, no men riddled with disease and shrunken with hunger, fighting to the last barehanded. Educated in the school for power, they were quick to recognize superior power. And when they did, they quit, quit cold. This is the end of the Axis African adventure. After all the racket, seems funny, don't it, Joe? So quiet. Yeah. What's biting you, Joe? I don't know. I can't help thinking all the hard work that went into those burnt-out tanks and half-tracks and airplanes, gone for nothing. 
Had to be done. Oh, sure it did. But still and all, think of all the trucks and automobiles and things all that junk might have been. I know. Bloody shame. Just because he was told that he was a superman. Well, he never figured things out for himself. Never argued the toss, same as we do. Too bad he didn't hear some of our arguments at the old dog and fox back home. You know, I guess that's the real difference between us and them. We argue the toss, as you say, and they don't. Yeah, and when you don't argue the toss anymore, you aren't half a man anymore. Right. You're just a blooming tool, like a spanner or a saw or a gimlet. Maybe they like it that way. Maybe they do, but suppose somebody tried to use you or me like that, Joe. Suppose somebody said, put that fella's eyes out or turn a hose pipe on that Jew or on that woman. Would we do it? What do you think? You and me, Joe, we may not always think alike, but we do think. You and me and old Alphonse. Then the rest, we certainly think all right. You know, George, I got an idea. Why can't we, after the war, the same work gang, I mean, keep on swinging together? What couldn't we do? You mean build more houses than ever was? Yeah, that's it. And ships, thousands of ships. Right. And food so as nobody be hungry no more? Yeah, building things up instead of blowing things up. Like, uh, I don't know, like dams in the desert and roads through the jungles. Maybe just cross all the oceans. We could do it, I bet you. Yeah, do all the jobs at once doing and knock the block off anybody who wants to start another war and bring the smiles back to the kids' faces all over the world. Boy, what a job. But just now, Joe, it's the same rough road. The same road you and me have just come. The same bloody hard road. And for quite a while yet. Boy, oh boy, what a job. Bringing back the smiles to kids' faces. <laughs> much nearer freedom. The liberating hosts are on the wing.